And we'll now have Elisha Kaufman come and speak to us about You Cannot Fool the Electronic Eye, Billy Graham, and Media. Following Alicia's talk, we'll have time for question and answer. In 1949, William Randolph Hearst famously boosted a young evangelist Los Angeles crusade with a two-word message to his newspaper editors, Puff Graham. In 2013, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association amassed one million likes on Facebook. Between these milestones, Graham became one of the most recognized, televised, photographed, published, and quoted figures in America and abroad, owing in large part to his adept engagement with media. Now, I use the word adept very intentionally. The intersection of media and evangelism is a tricky place to operate. There's a fine line between skillful and manipulative, savvy and slick. I will contend today that Billy Graham, media producer and media star, navigated that line adeptly as he advanced his two great goals, the evangelization of the world and the establishment of evangelicalism as a religious tradition. Graham's navigational skills were on vibrant display in his press conferences, so I will pay special attention to those sources. In terms of a structure for my remarks, I will first situate Graham in the history of American revivalism and media. I will then sketch the growth of Graham's own media empire before describing ways in which the evangelist's media savvy helped him withstand the scrutiny of the spotlight and redirect its wattage toward his desired ends. A direct ancestor to Graham emerged during the First Great Awakening, George Whitfield who preached on both sides of the Atlantic, up and down the American colonies, attracting huge crowds through the power of his oratory and the efficiency of his marketing machine. Whitfield pioneered the use of all available media to generate interest before his arrival in a town, to publicize his meetings as they happened, to reinforce his message to those who had heard it in person, to expand his audience to include those who had not been present, to shape the reportage of his results, and to continue the revival after he moved on. All of that work required a lot of ink. An astonishing 30% of all titles printed in America in 1740 were written by or about the famous evangelist. Whitfield also engendered controversies that pers persistently flare when preachers combine evangelism and commerce. He earned the scorn of Boston blue blood congregationalist Charles Chauncey, who, prefiguring some of Reinhold Niebuhr's criticisms of Graham 200 years later, found Whitfield's gospel hucksterism profoundly distasteful. Surely, Chauncey argued, it dishonors religion and the office of the clergy when Christianity is shilled on the street corner like any other cheap commodity. A writer for the Boston Weekly Newsletter in Whitfield's day thought there ought to be laws constraining peddlers in divinity. And if the content and delivery of peddled divinity weren't bad enough, Skeptics wondered where exactly did all that money collected by itinerant evangelists go? Graham was acutely aware of the caricature of the traveling preacher. In the sources I examined for this paper, he was far less likely to refer to one of his celebrated forebears, Whitfield, Charles Grandison Finney, Graham's personal hero, D.L. Moody, or Billy Sunday, than to the fictional phony Elmer Gantry, the main character in Sinclair Lewis's best-selling 1927 novel, as well as a 1960 movie starring Burt Lancaster, Gantry did some preaching of his own, but made an even bigger splash managing a female evangelist modeled on Amy Semple McPherson. Among Gantry's clever moves as manager was hiring a real press agent trained in newspaper work, circus advertising, and real estate promoting to sweet-talk city fathers into hosting revival meetings and then seed the local press with flattering, exclusive stories about the enchanting lady preacher. Gantry didn't disbelieve the gospel, exactly, but he got into the God racket because it made him more money and made him feel more important than his previous job of selling farm implements. Graham acknowledged this stereotype in order to counter it. Following the real-life scandal of Marjo, a fraudulent evangelist exposed in a 1972 documentary, 
Graham assured the assembled reporters at a Los Angeles press conference, quote, there was a time when we had some Elmer gantries. There's no doubt about it. I think that has been largely overcome. For example, in my own work, I have some of the finest reporters from the major magazines, from the Wall Street Journal up and down, that cover us regularly every year or two to see what we are doing with the finances. So I don't think I could get by in my position with anything." End quote. Note here the use of one media source, the Wall Street Journal, to counteract other sources, a novel, a feature film, a documentary, and potentially any negative stories that might be written or broadcast by the reporters at the press conference. Graham did not set himself up as the victim of a hostile press corps, as many conservative Christians did before and after him. Rather, he asserted that responsible journalists could verify his story and vouch for his character. If there was a better way to handle that situation, I can't imagine what it would be. George Whitfield and Elmer Gantry nicely illustrate the distinction between savvy and slick when it comes to media relations. Graham emulated Whitfield as he and his team used media to extend his evangelistic and movement building work through time and space. At the same time, Graham distinguished himself from Gantry not just by being morally upright, but also by using media to verify his authenticity. So Billy Graham as a modern Whitfield. Graham's media empire grew out of the 1949 Los Angeles Crusade and the meetings that followed in 1950. To keep the momentum of these crusades going, in November 1950, he launched the Hour of Decision radio program on 150 ABC stations. A few weeks into its still continuing run, the weekly broadcast was heard on 1,000 stations and it topped all other religious programs in the Nielsen ratings. Producing the show required more sustained work than Graham's crusade team could handle, though, so the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association was born, complete with offices and a secretary. There were also tax benefits to the creation of the nonprofit association. Soon the show spawned another challenge as it generated a tidal wave of mail from listeners, more than 178,000 letters in 1951, and twice that volume the next year. The BGEA staff swelled to more than 100 people, many of them handling correspondence. Graham also responded to listeners' questions by starting his My Answer syndicated newspaper column. Next, Graham moved into television with a version of Hour of Decision and into film with the launch of Worldwide Pictures. Decision Magazine followed in 1960. Like his evangelistic forebears, Graham adopted new technologies as soon as they became available. His 1957 New York City crusade was broadcast on live local television nightly for an unprecedented 16 weeks, and a weekly broadcast aired nationwide. His 1961 Philadelphia crusade was taped and then distributed to TV stations throughout the United States and Canada for later broadcast, an endeavor his press agency declared a first in the history of television. I believe there's some footage from that crusade that'll be shown here at noon. A short film created by Worldwide Pictures for the 1964 World's Fair, Man in the Fifth Dimension, also deployed cutting edge technology as Graham gushed in a press conference, stereophonic, the whole thing is in Todd A.O.'s new process, the first time it's ever been used. It's the same as Cinerama. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but the quote captures Graham's excitement about media technology. He was a voracious media consumer as well as a media producer and media subject. In 1993, the 75-year-old Graham participated in an hour-long live chat on America Online, this when things like the internet and email were brand new. And in 1995, with the help of 30 satellites, 160 digital editing machines, and 13 generators, he transmitted a sermon from San Juan, Puerto Rico to nearly 3,000 sites across the globe in an effort to reach one billion viewers, approximately one-fifth the population of the planet. The bulk of the media generated by Graham and the BGEA was evangelistic and closely tied to Graham's signature mode of outreach, the Urban Crusade. Hour of Decision radio broadcasts featured crusade sermons and songs, and the TV specials were lightly edited crusade videos. It's significant that Graham opted not to mount a regular TV broadcast, something like the 700 Club, which would have required considerably more money. 
Not carrying that expense, but instead purchasing occasional airtime for specials, meant that Graham never needed to go into the perpetual, highly charged fundraising mode that contributed to the televangelist scandals of the 1980s. Decision Magazine included the kinds of testimonies featured at crusade meetings, and the magazine existed primarily to raise funds for more meetings. Worldwide Pictures releases might or might not include crusade scenes, but their intent was the same. To put a gospel message in front of an audience Graham could not address personally, whether that audience gathered in theaters, in front of their televisions, overseas, or in prison. One of Graham's media ventures stood outside this ecosystem, Christianity Today magazine. Launched in 1956 and originally headquartered in Washington, D.C. before moving up the road from here, Carol Stream, CT was designed to help establish evangelicalism as a religious tradition in much the same way that its nemesis, the Christian century, had helped establish mainline Protestantism. In addition to reporting on evangelical leaders and institutions, CT helped define the boundaries of evangelicalism by publishing certain authors, but not others, carrying advertisements for certain books in academic institutions, but not others, and generally curating the biblical, theological, and political ideas that could carry the evangelical label. Christianity Today was distinct from the BGEA media universe, but Graham himself was always both an evangelist and a movement builder, and his press conferences found him switching constantly between the two roles. In fact, I would say that the press conferences worked because Graham performed both roles. Graham and his team typically called a press conference to attract attention for an upcoming crusade. Graham would open by thanking local supporters, saying a few words about how much he loved Cleveland or Miami or wherever he happened to be. And he or a, man, or a member of his media team would make sure the assembled reporters had the logistical details on the upcoming meetings. In this phase of the press conference, Graham was using media, as George Whitfield had, as an extension of his own publicity efforts. In the Q&A phase, however, reporters would turn the press conference around to their own interests, using their audience with the international celebrity to get his, and by extension evangelicals, quotable opinion on the issues of the day. Thus, the resulting headlines weren't just Graham to preach at local stadium, though there were lots of those stories, but also Graham deplores distortion of patriotism, or praises Jesus freaks, or in a bout of selective erroneous quotation in 1975, Billy Graham backs ordaining homosexuals. To make a long story short, he did not. <laughs> An exchange from a 1975 press conference in Lubbock, Texas, illustrates Graham's facility for using and being used by the media. You know, Graham told the assembled journalists, one of the things about being a well-known clergyman or a well-known evangelist is I'm supposed to be an authority on every conceivable subject. And I'm not an authority on many subjects. And there are a lot of the problems that we face today that I haven't figured out the answer to. Except if everybody would turn to God, everybody would turn to Christ, I think we could approach our problems with new attitudes." End quote. Having delivered that come to Jesus line, Graham proceeded to answer questions about Betty Ford's views on sex and marijuana, college morality, Watergate, the Equal Rights Amendment, the Middle East, and the American divorce rate. And then he proceeded to fill Jones Stadium at Texas Tech University. Mainstream journalists understood that pretty much any Graham story would provide him a platform for evangelization and the promotion of evangelical religion. The journalists accepted this bargain, however, for a number of reasons. One, Graham coverage fulfilled four of the seven classic news values. Prominence, he was famous. Proximity, Graham always got the attention of the local press when his crusade rolled into town. Impact, or number of lives affected, many Graham stories led off with numbers, crowds of thousands, TV audiences of millions. And thanks to the range of subjects covered in press conferences, Graham coverage also fulfilled currency, or relation to current events. Two, Graham was articulate and attractive. He made good copy and compelling airtime even when he wasn't doing anything new. As a result, he was invited to write for publications ranging from Family Circle to Cosmopolitan, the New York Times to the National Enquirer. He did guest spots on Johnny Carson, David Frost, Phil Donahue, 
And in a clip I could have brought if I'd had time, Woody Allen. Look that one up on YouTube. It's fantastic. Graham was profiled, albeit against his wishes and with only minimal cooperation, in Playboy. He could have shared his thoughts on pornography and censorship in a publication called Screw the Sex Review, but he declined the editor's invitation. Three, and this is the point I want to dwell on here, Graham enjoyed copious and strongly favorable media coverage because he was sincere, and sincere in a way especially suited to a media-saturated culture. Graham's personal sincerity and charisma certainly worked in his favor. Saul Braun, author of the 1971 Playboy profile, admitted, I discovered that Graham in private discourse is friendly, responsive, and alert. Everybody goes away from him, liking him immensely, and so did I. Many other journalists have recorded similar impressions. Furthermore, Graham and his organizations operated strictly above board, eschewing both sexual and financial hanky-panky. When Harold Fye, then editor of the Christian Century, asked an investigative reporter to follow the money flowing around Graham's 1957 New York crusade, all he found was a rumor that excessive payments had been made to an ad agency. Unsubstantiated, the story went nowhere. Personal probity, however, was not enough to endear Graham to everyone. The specter of Elmer Gantry lingered, renewed with each new televangelist scandal. Besides, not everyone could meet Graham personally. Most people encountered him through mass media, so that is the realm in which he needed to convey his authenticity. Methods of conveying authenticity varied by medium. The tone of the My Answer newspaper columns, along with a smiling thumbnail photo, lent a personal touch to highly repetitive and almost certainly ghost-written texts. Photo-rich magazine spreads of the Graham family at home complete with witty comments from Ruth and self-deprecating remarks from Billy, brought the superstar down to earth. Radio, the longtime home of Hour of Decision, is an especially intimate medium, a hot medium in Marsha McLuhan's typology, grabbing listeners with a stream of high-definition auditory information. Television, for McLuhan a cool medium, required more active participation from the audience and thus allowed more room for non-participation, more room for doubt to seep into the critical distance. Graham had his work cut out for him on television, but it was the key medium of the second half of the 20th century, so he set out to conquer it. During, naturally, a TV talk show appearance with Britain's Russell Hardy in 1973, Graham put it this way, television is a medium of face-to-face -face communication. It's the most powerful medium we've ever known. And whether you're selling a bar of soap or whatever you're doing, television is the way to do it today. So you're taking hold of the medium by the scruff of its neck, Hardy asked. Well, Graham answered, we're using the medium. I think that this medium has been given. It can be used for good. In order to use television for good, Graham also had to use it well. He and his organization needed to achieve technological excellence. They needed to deploy a mixture of shots close on the evangelist's face for immediacy and zoomed out to depict the enthusiastic, thoroughly convinced crowd. In his 1966 biography of Graham, John Pollock wrote, when the average moral rep reputable American sees Dr. Graham in a studio telling him he needs to be born again, his first impulse will be to discredit him as a religious fanatic. But if the viewer sees thousands of respectable, normal people listening and consenting to all this he hears, and then sees hundreds voluntarily get up and walk to the front in response to a low-pressure request, he'll begin to consider the message and situation with some sincere, honest interest. It's much easier to say a single speaker is wrong than to discredit the conviction and decision of thousands. Of course, becoming too proficient at TV presentation put Graham again at risk of being perceived as an Elmer Gantry, all flash and no substance. Thinking along these lines, in 1972, a reporter asked Graham how much show business had influenced him. His response, from which I took the title of this paper, encapsulates the balance he sought. Graham said, I don't see much difference in our crusades now than before except we dress a little more conservatively now than we used to dress 20 years ago when we had bow ties that we could push a little button and they would light up on both sides. <laughs> we don't do any of that anymore. 
We have no gimmicks because you cannot fool the electronic eye of that camera. And people can see whether you're sincere or not. It is true that our crusades are partially designed because of the cameras. We have to. The timing has to be right. You have to have excellent personnel who do the singing and the music and that sort of thing. I suppose in that way we have adapted ourselves to television, but I would not call it show business." End quote. To be a George Whitfield in an Elmer Gantry world, Graham needed to adapt himself to television and an array of other media without straying into show business. Skillful, but not manipulative. Savvy, but not slick. His long record of popularity with scandal-hungry journalists and scandal-weary audiences alike indicates that he succeeded. <laughs>